Hello and welcome to Unity Presbyterian Church Online. This week in worship, it is Transformation Sunday, and Pastor Dana takes a look at experiences on the mountaintop. Let's listen. Lutheran minister who was serving a church in Montana, and he made headline news. And the reason that he made headline news is because he delivered a one-minute sermon on a Super Bowl Sunday. So on that Super Bowl Sunday, he climbed into the pulpit and he said, my favorite team is playing today. I don't want to miss a minute of the pregame, the festivities, the tailgating. Y'all know Jesus loves you. So let's call it a day. Climbed out of the pulpit, left the church. Now, such is not the case for us this morning. The Dallas Cowboys are not playing in the Super Bowl. We also live on the East Coast, so all of the festivities will start later in the day. So no one-minute sermon. But in addition to it being Holy Super Bowl Sunday, it is also Holy Transfiguration Sunday, which means that in addition to all of the Super Bowl festivities, we are also celebrating the transfiguration of Christ and what all that means for our lives. On Transfiguration Sunday, we celebrate how Jesus transfigured himself right before the disciples' eyes, therefore revealing his identity as the Son of God. And we hear about this story in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. It says, Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up on a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I will make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he spoke, A bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son, who brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified and fell face down on the ground. So in this passage of Matthew, we hear about Jesus becoming transfigured before the disciples. And we learn that all of this is taking place on the top of a mountain. All throughout scripture, we hear about these major significant events happening on mountaintops. For instance, in the Old Testament, it was on top of Mount Sinai where Moses received the Ten Commandments from God. This image that Janine's going to pull up is an image of an oil painting from the 19th century. It was painted by Jean-Léon Jerome, depicting this significant event. It was on top of Mount Pisgah, where Moses was able to see the promised land after wandering many, many years. It was on top of Mount Moriah, where Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac. And at the top of Mount Arat, where Noah saw the rainbow signifying God's new covenant, and where the ark rested until the waters subdued. In the New Testament, it was the Mount of Beatitudes where Jesus delivered the Sermon on the Mount and the top of Mount Calvary where Jesus was nailed to the cross. So all of that is to say that there are major significant events that happened on top of mountains. And the setting for the transfiguration of Christ was no different as it happened on top of Mount Tabor. And maybe you all, have your own stories, these significant events and experiences that occurred while you were on top of a mountain. There is something magical that happens once you get out into the beauty of God's creation, once you start hiking these mountains that God created for us. There is something profound that occurs when we step away from the noise and the commotion of this world and we retreat into the mountains. That is where we can begin to hear God's voice as all the other voices are silenced. So this morning, I wanted to share a story with you all about a significant event that occurred to me 
when I was on top of a mountain. Now, I have always loved being outdoors and hiking. And so one year, I decided that I was going to go ice climbing. So for those of the, you who are not familiar with ice climbing, this is when you set aside all logic and reasoning and you decide to go and climb these huge frozen waterfalls. And so I enlisted the help of a friend and we spent some time reading and researching where we were going to embark on this ice climbing adventure. And so after researching, we decided we were going to go ice climbing in the Catskills Mountains in New York. And the part of the Catskills that we were going to, they were called the Gunks. Now, the Gunks have the highest peaks in the entire Catskill mountain chain. This is world-renowned for ice climbing enthusiasts and experts. So clearly the best spot for us newly inexperienced ice climbers to go. So we picked a date, we flew into New York City, we rented a car, we drove the hour and a half into the Catskills Mountains. And so there we met our guide who proceeded to take us on a two day long mountaineering ice climbing adventure. So on day one of this ice climbing adventure, we put on all of the necessary gear. So two layers of thermals on the bottom, six layers on top. You have your ski coat, your ski pants, you have gloves, you have a balaclava, which is a face mask. You have your helmet, of course, and you also have something called crampons. Now, crampons are a traction device and they um, attach to the bottom of your boot. And this is what allows you to walk through the snowy, icy mountain. They also have two or three spikes on the front so that you can kick in to this frozen waterfall as you are climbing and making your way up. And then you have ice axes. So you're climbing up with your crampons and your ice axes. So we start this excursion. I have on all of my gear. I make it about 200 feet and I think I'm going to die. All of these layers, all of this gear. But we keep going. We press on. We hike for a couple hours and we get to the base of a waterfall. And so from there, we spent the next few hours learning all the basics of how to ice climb. We spent the remainder of the afternoon climbing one of the tallest waterfalls in New York. On day two of this ice climbing adventure, we hike all day along this fairly large creek. And finally, we get to the top of a waterfall. And at that point, our guide tells us that we are going to repel 450 feet into the basin of the waterfall. So we tie all the necessary knots that we have to tie and we attach them to our carabiners and we attach the carabiners to our gear. And so everything is ready. And so my guide looks at me and he says, all right, you're going to be the first one to repel. So go stand on the edge of the waterfall and stabilize yourself in the harness. In order to stabilize yourself in the harness, you have to put your feet on the very edge, the cliff. Let's call it a cliff. The cliff of the waterfall and then lean back into the harness so that you can distribute the weight into the harness evenly. So all of that doesn't sound too scary until you're standing at the edge of a 450 foot tall waterfall. And then at that point, there's all kinds of thoughts that go through your mind. Thoughts like, I'm the first one to do this. How do we know we tied those knots correctly? How do we know the carabiners are going to hold my weight? How do we know I'm not going to just plummet? Maybe this isn't the safest thing to be doing. There are all kinds of thoughts and fears and worries and anxieties that go through your mind. So when my guide looked at me and told me to go stand on the cliff and to lean back and to stabilize myself, I looked him straight in the eyes and I said, I don't think so. I'm not going to be able to do that. We're going to have to talk about this a little bit more. I'm a verbal processor. We're going to talk about my thoughts and my emotions and work through that out loud. And so the guide responded and he said, at this point in the day, the only way down from this mountain is to repel. Otherwise, we're spending the night on the snowy mountain. So there's no other option. There's no exit strategy against my better judgment. I walk over to the side of this waterfall 
and I lean back and I stabilize myself in my harness. And I'll just tell you, that was probably one of the most terrifying moments in my life. And to be in that position voluntarily and to also have paid a significant amount of money to be in that situation makes it even worse. So I lean back and I begin repelling down this waterfall and I get about halfway down and I can start to breathe again. Like I can breathe some air in and I'm breathing out at a normal pace. And I get three quarters of the way down and I start to realize I'm not going to die after all. And then I hit the base of the waterfall and I'm standing on stable ground and I could have done cartwheels at that point. I was so glad to be on stable ground again. But let me just tell you, when I sat on the base of that waterfall, just looking up and waiting for my friend and my guide to rappel down, I had this overwhelming sense of joy and happiness, a huge sense of accomplishment and satisfaction. I was so happy to be safe. I was so happy to be on stable ground again. But I was so happy that I had done it, that I hadn't given in to those worries, those fears that were overwhelming me. Experience of ice climbing that day in the Catskills, it forever changed me and transformed me. It changed me and transformed me as it gave me a deeper sense of gratitude and appreciation for my guide who had taught us all of these things over the course of two days. I had a deeper sense of gratitude and appreciation for my friend who had accompanied me on this crazy journey. But I also had a deeper insight about myself, what sort of fears and challenges that I could face and handle, what I could withstand and endure physically. It cultivated a deep sense of determination and perseverance. There are some pretty profound things that can happen on top of mountains. And the stories of the Bible are no different. In our passage from Matthew, we got to encounter one of those instances as Jesus transfigured himself on top of Mount Tabor. The Greek word transfigured is metamorphomai. And when Mark and Matthew use this word, they are referring to the transfiguration of God or the transfiguration of God through Jesus. But the Apostle Paul also used this word. And when he used this word, he was referring to the transfiguration that occurs within oneself. The transformation that can and does take place within each of us when we encounter God. We see this recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. It says, in all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This transfiguration, this metamorphomai, this revelation of God's glory right before a person's eyes, it cannot and it does not happen without also transforming the person that's experiencing it, that's standing in the presence of God. Such was the case for Peter, James, and John when they stood face to face with Jesus. And as Jesus revealed God's glory right before their eyes, as those disciples watched that occur, they were forever changed and transformed. It gave them a deeper insight and appreciation for God and Jesus. It gave them a deeper insight and appreciation for one another. And it also changed it redefined what they would also go on to do next, how they would live the rest of their lives. And we see that de- redefining moment in the next verse. Verse says, 7 says, Then Jesus came over. Now remember, they're lying face down on the ground. So Jesus comes over to them and he says, Get up. He says, Get up and do not be afraid. When Jesus said that to them, Essentially, Jesus was telling them to get up off the ground, to shake off all of their fear, all of their anxiety, and to take everything that they had learned from him and to apply it. To apply it by walking down the mountain, 
and sharing it with those who are living in the valley. In such the same way that my ice climbing guide looked me straight in the eyes and he told me to lean back in that harness and to rappel 450 feet down this waterfall, essentially my guide was saying, shake off all of your fears. Shake off your anxieties. Take everything that I have taught you over the course of two days and apply it. Apply it by walking down the mountain with it. Friends, the transfiguration of Jesus that occurred on the top of Mount Tabor is not just about how Jesus revealed his identity as the Son of God. It is so much more. It has so much more to do with how the disciples were transformed through that experience, what they learned through that significant event, what they learned about God, what they learned about themselves, what they learned about each other. It has much more to do with how that experience shaped them and defined what they would go on to do next. And as we celebrate Transfiguration Sunday today, it has so much more to do with recognizing and celebrating the ongoing process of God continually revealing his grace and his glory to us and what we learn from those encounters, what we learn about ourselves, what we learn about God and each other, and how those experiences will shape and redefine the way that we will continue to live our lives. Transfiguration Sunday has much more to do with what we will do next, what we will do with what we've learned through those face-to-face encounters with God once we repel off the mountain, how we will apply all that we have learned by sharing it with those who are living beyond the walls of this church. So this Wednesday, we will begin our Lenten journey. And as all of us prepare to embark on our Lenten journey, may the transfiguration of Christ set the tone. May we each spend some time thinking about all the various ways in which God has revealed his grace and glory to us over the years. And in response, may we shake off our fears, shake off our anxieties, and repel down the mountain, applying all of those things we have learned to our lives. May we spend some time contemplating what we will do next and how we will share all that we have learned with those who live in the valley, those who live beyond the walls of this church. Amen. If you would like more information about Unity Presbyterian Church, please visit our website at www.unitypres.org or visit us on Facebook. This is the Unity Presbyterian Church Podcast. Have a great week.